Hi, everyone. My name is Robert Cardillo. I'm the chief strategist and the chairman here at Planet Federal. And I have the distinct pleasure of speaking with General John Hyten today. General Hyten is serving as our 11th vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In this capacity, he is our nation's second highest ranking military officer and a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. General Hyten is also a former boss and a leading light and is a, strate a strategic thinker in all things about our, national, our nation and our security. General Hyten, thank you so much for joining us here today. I look forward to our conversation. I look forward to it. It's good to see you again. Good morning. So if it's okay, I'm gonna begin the conversation with the end in mind, as you've announced your intention to retire at the end of this year. And I'm quite positive you'll be sprinting through the tape. No worries there. But I also imagine that you might have a reflection or two about not only your time as vice chairman, but also your long distinguished service to our nation. Anything stand out uh, in terms of achievements and maybe what's, what's left to be achieved? Oh, that's a, that's a broad question. But uh, I think first of all, uh, my retirement was announced the, the day I took the job. Uh, because the, the day I took the job, it was a two-year appointment. And uh, by law, I can't serve longer than November the 21st. So uh, a lot of people think I made a decision. That decision was made for me a long time ago. Uh, not that Laura's complaining about that. We're, uh, we're fine with that decision and, and moving on to the next chapter. But you're right, we're sprinting through the finish. And as I look back, I think two things uh, really strike me. One good and one not so good. Uh, the the good thing is that, you know, the uh, the first time I raised my right hand uh, and swore an oath to this country was in 1977. Uh, and that's when I started uh, my ROTC scholarship at, at Harvard. Uh, and I swore that oath at MIT because I wasn't allowed on campus uh, at Harvard because ROTC was kicked off. So we had to cross and roll. Uh, and uh, 1977 was two years after Saigon. So uh, uh, many people in the audience may not remember that long ago, but uh, the military was not healthy. Uh, the military was not healthy internally, and it was not healthy externally in this country. And in the 44 years since then, uh, the military has become one of the most respected elements of our nation. Uh, it has become uh, one of the most powerful, probably the most powerful military ever built. Uh, we went from a hollow force in 1977 just to the most powerful military in the world in 1990, 1991. Uh, and then we stayed the most powerful military. So, uh, so being part of that transformation is, uh, has been a pretty rewarding experience. And the, the best part about that was the people I got to work with for the last 40 years. The not so good side is that I've watched the same enterprise that when I came in on active duty in 1981, uh, was unbelievably nimble, uh, agile, and could move fast and to respond to a, a threat that appeared from anywhere. It was just remarkable how fast we could move and do things and build things and deliver things. And we were innovative and, uh, and it was really fun to be a part of that organization. Uh, and then I watched slowly as we began to try to remove all risk from our enterprise. Uh, I, I think because our uh, we, we convinced ourselves we didn't have any threats and we're the world's only superpower and therefore we should try to remove all risk from our business. Uh, this is not a, a business you can remove all risk from. You're going to have to figure out how to take risk. But when we did that, we moved all the decisions, as many as we could, from the field into the Pentagon. Uh, and we created a, a bureaucratic structure that just makes it so difficult for us to innovate and move fast. And now we have adversaries that are going unbelievably fast. Uh, we better figure out how to move fast again. And we better figure out how to push authority back down to the field. So I'm concerned about the pace of uh, how fast we can do things anymore uh, in this business. So I'm unbelievably proud to have been part of this organization for a long time. I still have six weeks to go and I'll run right through the tape. Uh, but uh, I'm a little concerned about our ability to, to move fast enough to stay up with our competitors. General, thank you very much. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. 
about those endpoints. And uh, I share your concern uh, about our pace and our ability to step up to the competition. And that's one of the things I wanted to speak with you about this morning. Um, I used to say that the easiest way to lose a race is to not know you're in one. And you're absolutely right. We are in one big time now. Can we pick up on your thought about that that risk aversion, right? I call it decision aversion as well that we've we've accumulated over time, maybe maybe for good reasons at that time. And and just help me, us think through how we turn that around. And I'll just share this thought from my last leadership position at, at National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. I just had way too many people who had the authority to say no. And very, very few people who either had the authority or the in some cases, maybe the courage to say yes, but that's, you know, that's not, that's not legislative, that's not policy, you know, and there's a lot of culture in there. So any thoughts on how we, we turn that tide? So there's, there's actually legislation, policy, and culture that, that drives that. Uh, you can look back over the history of, of program development, for example, uh, you can look at it in a number of areas, but if you look at program development and, uh, capability development, uh, what you'll see is that uh, every time uh, somebody has done something wrong or something stupid, like, you know, buying a thousand dollar hammer or a, you know, a $6,000 toilet seat or whatever it was, the, the solution to the problem wasn't to just hold that person accountable, fire them and find somebody else to go do it. The solution was to create a bureaucratic process over the top of it to make sure that it never happens again. Uh, sometimes Congress did that. Sometimes OSD said that. Sometimes we did that to ourselves. Uh, and we basically, every time they do, we did that, we set up an element of the bureaucracy who is only authorized to say no, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that that bad thing never happened. And you had to fight through the no bureaucracy all the way up until you finally got to a yes in order to make a decision to move forward. Uh, we can't do that anymore. Uh, and and the, the difference is the threat. The threat is right in front of us. Uh, and, and the threat is China. Uh, we want China just to be a competitor. We want to be in competition with China. We don't want to go to war with China. That's the last thing in the world we want to do. But in order to do that, we have to be able to, to deter. In order to deter, we have to be able to have the capabilities that can challenge China uh, in every domain, in every structure, in every way that we can. And in order to do that, we have to go back to where we were in the Cold War, when we would delegate responsibility down and hold people accountable for doing their job and doing it right and delivering the capability that we need. And when, it, and when they don't do that, we hold them accountable, we fire them and find somebody else that will. And I remember when I was a, a young engineer, a captain in Los Angeles in the space business, my first experience in the Air Force space business how I wanted to grow up and be the colonel in Los Angeles. That, that would have been the, the dream. Uh, that's because the colonels had all the authority, responsibility, and the money in order to make the decisions and move forward and deliver capabilities. And I, I remember one occasion where somebody didn't do that and was fired. But the thing that sticks in my mind is that like 10 colonels lined up fighting for the next, to be the next guy in, because that's where you wanted to be because you had the authority, responsibility, accountability, and the money. Mm -hmm. to the job. We have to push that back out. And Congress is actually trying to, uh, to do that with legislation. They've allowed OSD. OSD is pushing things back to the service as the services are starting to push things back down. But it's got to be all focused on the threat. You have to move faster than the threat. It doesn't matter how far you head in a race to put another analogy on the one you used. We're ahead in the race right now. But if somebody's running faster than you in the race, they're eventually going to pass you. And that's what my fear is. My fear is that we'll allow that to happen with China in particular. Over. Oh, thank you very much. Um, it's a compelling and uh, I know uh, energizing argument. And I agree with you completely that we just need to uh, first acknowledge it and then take it on. Um, I want to step to a, an even broader picture. You bring up um, China uh, in our in our ongoing uh, peer competition, uh, planet's value proposition from the beginning has been you know can we find a way to see and sense the entirety of the globe, do that once a day, and then over time 
measure, and then when measure and manage uh, change that we're detecting. Um, the other thing that that provides is what I would call a global transparency. And if we could talk about that, General, with respect to the competition that we're in, I've made the argument that that transparency is an advantage for us, that, that broadly speaking, we're up for the competition and we're up to be open uh, in that competition. From your position in the Defense Department, I appreciate transparency can cut both ways. There are, there are advantages uh, to that openness and perhaps there are risks as well. Can you help us uh, how that, or help explain how that looks from your lens, that global transparency, the increased connectivity that we're all experiencing? So I'll give you uh, two examples of why transparency from a global perspective is so important. And I'll, I'll use Planet uh, as the example. Uh, one was the, uh, the missile attack uh, on uh, um, Al-Assad Air Base uh, in the 12th of January of 2020. Um, the, the media was portraying that as a, as a haphazard uh, attack that just randomly missed everybody and uh, uh, that was not that big a deal and that nobody was trying to kill anybody and uh, and, it w and I'll just say you, you may be surprised to know but uh, we, we actually had pictures of that event uh, but couldn't share those pictures with anybody. Then Planet came out I don't remember what newspaper it showed up in but it showed up in the newspaper and it showed exactly the the lay down of the missile attack. And it was very structured and very uh, focused. And it was obviously uh, with the intent to, to, to kill a lot of people. Uh, when you look at that lay down, uh, the, the missiles were very accurate. You could see the lay down on the, and to be able to show that and talk about that gave both the chairman and me the, the talking points we needed to explain to the American people in the world what the intent of that attack really was because we could, sh we could show a picture and we could say all we want, but when you actually show a picture, it's usually valuable. And now fast forward, you know, uh, 20 months to just a few weeks ago uh, when uh, pictures showed up in the media of the new Chinese missile fields. Um, uh, the, those pictures, we, we couldn't talk about those capabilities. We couldn't talk about what China was doing in their nuclear modernization program. Now all of a sudden you see pictures of silos being built in large numbers, hundreds of them in China. And now we can point to those pictures and say, this is what China is doing and how fast they're doing it. Have that ability. And I have no trouble with people taking pictures of us on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, if we actually get into a war and we're into a war, then there are certain things that, that I'm gonna to wanna to protect uh, as we go through that. I think we need to have those relationships that we get in, in times of war where we, where we understand. Uh, some people call that shutter control, that's, that's a fair term, uh, but those should be very few and far between and those should only be in times of war when, when the, uh, the risk to American servicemen and women uh, by the release of some kind of uh, imagery would cost them their lives. Other than that, uh, to me, we should be fully transparent for the reasons I, I think those two examples state exactly right. Uh, it, I don't think anybody in the world is surprised to know that we can take pictures from space uh, and the pictures are pretty darn good. And it's actually pretty useful to tell the story about what's really going on, over. So thank you. And I'm going to, uh really build on, on that conversation, General, and, and talk about um, a, a different kind of threat, and that's the, uh, the changing nature of our climate, um, rising sea levels, you know, melting ice caps, et cetera. And uh, it, it, I think it's always been true, but it's been recently clearer and, and more uh, well um, uh, recognized that it's also a security risk. Um, it isn't just a risk to, it, well, if it's a risk to human populations, it's a risk to us. Um, how do you see uh, the Defense Department's role? Um, I suspect one is a consumer of those changes to understand uh, adaptation, agility that you discussed earlier that we might need to build in. But is, is there a broader role 
um, with respect to dealing with the changing uh, climate uh, to ensure that we can continue to do what we need to do to keep the nation safe? I think there's, uh, there's at least two factors that really impact the Defense Department uh, as we go forward. Three, if you think about how we have to adjust to help with the, the, the climate problem. And I'll, I'll talk, talk about that one at the end, but let me talk about the, the big two issues uh, right away. Uh, number one, if you look at our critical bases, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, you, we have so many critical bases that are right on the coasts of our country and, and other places around the world that, that sit right on the oceans. Uh, and uh, climate change uh, creates a, a significant threat to those bases from a long-term perspective, just because of the rising of the oceans, but uh, more specifically because it creates these massive storms that continue to hit uh, uh, our country in particular. Uh, and Tyndall is a perfect example. Uh, Tyndall was destroyed and it's being rebuilt. Uh, we have got to find uh, some way to make sure that we can continue to operate from these bases. Uh, and every time it happens, it costs us billions of dollars. We, this, is, this is not insured through Mutual of Omaha. This is insured through the American people and the taxpayers and the taxpayers pay that. And we pay billions and billions of dollars each year to rebuild the infrastructure that is destroyed by the events caused by climate change. Uh, so we need to understand that. Uh, and we need to deal with that. Climate change is also changing the Arctic in a huge way. Uh, uh, in the not too distant future, the Arctic is gonna be open. There will be a Northwest Passage uh, that will be open uh, for, for commerce. It will open the Arctic for uh, uh, resources uh, and uh, you know, the avail ability to uh, find oil and other critical elements uh, especially on the petroleum side, will open up that part of the world. Uh, that creates uh, potential environmental issues, but it also take, creates potential conflicts between nations as we start to really, for the first time, since they're no longer covered with ice, argue over who has the authority to fish there, who has the authority to uh, drill there, who has the authority to walk into that. That's going to create huge tension. And then the path of commerce that goes through that has to be protected as well. Uh, that means we're going to have to have the ability to go north uh, to do that. You listen to the NORTHCOM commander talk. Uh, you listen to the Alaska, Alaska NORAD uh, commander talk. You listen to the Alaska command commander talk, same guy. But uh, they're very concerned. Uh, Canada is very concerned. Uh, the Nor Norway, Finland, Sweden, all concerned as you, as you look north. Denmark because of Greenland. Uh, everything is changing as we go through that. And then finally, uh, the Department of Defense uh, uses masses of amounts of fuel. Uh, you know, we're going to have to change the way we do that to help uh, the world on the climate side as well. And so B-52 re-engineering, for example, uh, saves enormous amounts of gas. There's opportunities for new engines on the F-35. There's opportunities to save enormous amounts of fuel and thus do our part to that. So we're gonna change in order to do that as well. So it's impacting us in multiple ways. I guess I'll stop there, thanks. Thanks, I'm uh, gonna pick up on that and talk about the, uh, the uh, ongoing pandemic uh, that we're all experiencing at all levels of our society and around the globe. And you know, maybe COVID uh, was natural, maybe it wasn't, but e either way, I, I feel strongly it's been a lesson uh, many lessons, but one is how debilitating the bio threat could be. Um, now we have more new technology, uh, commercial synthetic biology, et cetera. Um, how do you think, and, and, and I'll just say too, that we've, you know, we've become accustomed over time to appreciate how important cybersecurity has, uh, uh, is in all of our lives, but certainly in defending the nation. As you, as you think uh, ahead, uh, you know, for your successors, um, where does that fit this bio threat um, in your mindset? And, and how do we, I guess, posture our thinking, if nothing else, to be prepared to deal with it? So I, I can tell you that uh, when I became the vice chairman in November of 2019, 
Uh, the last thing I thought I'd do for 18 months of my time as chair of the DOD COVID task force with the Deputy Secretary of Defense. That's the last place I thought it. And for six months, really, that was all I spent my time doing. Uh, probably 90% of my time from April through uh, October of, of last year was on COVID uh, because it's that significant to the nation. Uh, and, and we had to figure out medically uh, where we we're going to go. We had to figure out uh, to buy vaccines uh, ahead of, you know, the, the, the final clinical trials, the tier three clinical trials, to buy the vaccines in billions of dollars worth, knowing that it would take six months to manufacture them, not even knowing if they'd work then. Then going through the enormous testing process to make sure they worked, and then going through the process with the FDA to make sure they were safe and all that stuff. Uh, I learned an enormous amount. And so uh, whoever the vice chairman is in the future, this is gonna have to be a big issue. The other thing is that Northcom had a plan for dealing with the pandemic, to dealing with a biological attack uh, uh, or a pandemic. Uh, and we'd, we'd ex exercise that plan a couple of times. And uh, like Eisenhower said, you know, a long time ago, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. And the plan did not survive first contact. It, it was just wrong. So we've, we're updating the plan. It's got to be a more global plan. We have to be able to respond to that. Uh, we see vulnerabilities of that as well. Uh, we have to figure out how to be more nimble. And then we have to do a better job of communicating and educating the American people about how to respond to that because it's killed 700,000 people. Uh, and I, I see all the intel. And I can tell you, Robert, I don't know where it came from. I, I don't because the Chinese have prevented us from knowing where it came from. And They've obfuscated, they've held people out, they won't work with the international community and tells you who they are. Uh, so I worry very much about that threat as we go forward, but this nation has to posture itself and our allies have to posture themselves to be better prepared to respond to the next pandemic, whatever it is, because in this global community, another one is gonna come somewhere down the road, whether it's a new version of COVID or another COVID 22 or whatever it happens to be, we better be ready before it because we have to be ready if somebody chooses to unleash such an attack on the world as well. Uh, and that would be a frightening day, but we've learned a lot and we've, we've built an infrastructure now that responds actually pretty fast. Uh, but we have to build trust with our population, trust with the world that we know what we're doing and how to respond. Over. Couldn't agree more. And, you know, like you, well, uh, in a similar way as, as you did in many of your positions, you know, you and I spent a lot of time on continuity of government exercises, right? We would do these drills, break glass on different events. When I was director of NGA, we would do these, well, what if, what if we lost power to this building, right? What if, what if we lost, you know, had a cyber attack that brought down this entity? I have to tell you, I did not have in my mind and my successor had to deal with this, what if I have to send home 90% of my workforce, you know, out of the SCIF, the secured environment? On the positive side though, and again, nobody, nobody wanted to go through this, but one of the lessons I hope we learn is that we do need to be able to work much more adaptively in the future and find a way to, um, I'll call it succeed in the open, uh, in the way we have in those closed rooms. Um, so I'm hopeful that there's some, some, some positive lessons learned uh, to your point about how we, how we deal with whatever the next event uh, is, whether it's natural or, or purposeful. Uh, in a similar vein, General, both you and I, you know, made this pretty strong pursuits in the realm of the very large category of artificial intelligence. Uh, you were a leading advocate. You are a leading advocate. Um, um, here's Robert's point of view, and I'll just ask for yours. Um, I feel like we're making the right speeches, uh, including myself. Uh, I worry when I look at the program uh, that we're investing what we need to be. And, and I just wonder, um, do you see uh, from your seat, uh, are we putting, I'll say our money where our mouth is with respect to the, the investment that's required? Uh, and maybe this goes back to your earlier answer about, you know, kind of the ponderous uh, acquisition cycle that we had had. Uh, in our system, but uh, where are we in your mind with the race uh, that's ongoing in the artificial intelligence um, uh, category? And, uh, and what do we need to do to uh, increase our advantage? 
So I, I tell you, there's, I think there's two things, Robert. Uh, um, first of all, on the government side, um, we have to realize that uh, it is a race uh, and the winner of the race will have a significant advantage in the world for the rest of the century, probably. Uh, whoever actually figures out how to embrace artificial intelligence and use it correctly. Uh, now there's a challenge about you know, using it correctly and incorrectly. There's a there's ethical discussions about what what you can and can't use artificial intelligence for. Uh, to me, it can't be used to start a war, uh, but it can can be used to help finish a war. Uh, the, the, I think that's the 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 way I phrase it in my top level view. It's a, a much more complicated discussion than that than we have time for today. But we have to make sure we understand that. And then we have to invest more from uh, the department's perspective in doing that. We're not investing enough right now. We are investing a lot. Uh, but I think the biggest issue uh, beyond our own, own investments, which should increase, is figuring out a way to work effectively with the, the intellectual power of America, uh, which in, in many cases is in Seattle and, and uh, Silicon Valley and Austin and Cambridge and and the various pockets that are actually working that uh, and making huge progress uh, uh, in the commercial sector uh, moving forward very fast. And we still struggle in this government figuring out how to embrace that. Uh, if you look at the partnership we had with industry uh, back in the Cold War, uh, we had a very tight partnership with industry. Why? Because everybody recognized the challenge that the Soviet Union uh, uh, created for the United States. We need to realize the challenge that China creates for the United States as well. And we all need to be able to work together in order to make sure that the United States uh, and our allies are properly positioned and using artificial intelligence in the right way in order to defend this nation and defend, uh, defend the, uh, the Western liberal order that's been in place for, well, we're in the 76th year of it now. The 76th year of, of not peace on earth, but the lack of great power war. Uh, and that is hugely important. And artificial intelligence has a critical role in preventing that great power war from happening. And, and the United States and the West better figure out how to get there from here. And that means we have to do two things, invest more, but partner better with the commercial sector. And we're not doing that well right now. Um. Again, uh, complete agreement. Um, one of the things I've found in the two and a half years I've spent now on the other side is uh, quite frankly, I, even additional clarity on sometimes how hard we, the government is to work with to, to be that partner. But, but the guidance and the leadership that you've shown general uh, uh, is making a difference. And I just wanted to thank you because uh, there are more doors now and there are more handshakes. Uh, and we, I think we're rediscovering that that ingenuity and the partnership you described uh, 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 some time ago. And I think it comes down to, as you said, that shared mission, right? What, what's our objective here? And, and, uh, and I think we're, we're, we're gaining that every day. General, we just have a, a few minutes left. Again, thanks for your time. Um, I opened with a very broad question about how did, how did the career go? Um, I'm gonna ask a, a similar way, but a similar question, but in a different way. You spoke about raising your right hand in 1977. Um, other women and men are doing the same today uh, and tomorrow. Um, could you impart some advice to those young um, uh, entrants uh, to our profession? Whether, and by the way, I consider the profession to be in uniform, uh, civilians and public and private. So they could be anywhere in the spectrum, might be in Seattle or Boston right now, but. Uh, any advice you'd pass on to them as, they, uh, as they're ready to grab the baton that you've been carrying for so long? Uh, I'll tell the quick story of why I'm still in uniform. Uh, there's a million reasons, but uh, you know, I'd, I'd been in about 10 years and I was at the point, I, my whole plan was to get out after four years and then it was after six and then it was after eight. And finally at the 10 year point, well, nine year point really, uh, I found a company uh, that, that wanted to hire me and triple my salary and give me, uh, you know, signing bonuses and stock options and all the things I wanted uh, to do, I thought at the time. And I went home and I told my wife, uh, well, that was a mistake by itself, telling your wife, I, this is a family decision. And I 
told her I made a decision to get out of the Air Force. And she said, well, why are you going to quit the Air Force? I said, I'm not quitting. I'm just taking another. No, you're quitting. Why are you quitting? I said, well, we get more money. Don't we have enough money now? Well, we'd have a bigger house. Don't you like where we live? Uh, well, you know, we could, uh, we, could, uh, we could do this. We could do that. You know, and she kept asking me, why are you going to quit what you love? And finally, I realized, why would I quit what I love to do to chase a dollar? Uh, you're never going to get rich in the government service. You're never going to get rich in the public sector. But oh my gosh, the, the benefits and the, and the value you get from trying to make the world a better place, trying to make the country a better place, is so much more valuable than a dollar. Uh, that, that common purpose, it doesn't matter whether you're a civilian at NGA or a, a soldier in the 82nd Airborne, that, that common purpose of trying to make the world better, that common purpose of coming to work with people with similar values to you that, that are, that's, that's hard to, to match. So uh, as you think about service and you think about your life, uh, working for something bigger than you are uh, is so much easier to get up in the morning and go to work for that than it is to go chase a dollar. I'm not arguing that chasing a dollar isn't fun. I'm sure it is. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure that other people uh, enjoy that. But I just love waking up in the morning, putting on the uniform, and coming to work with the best people in the world, trying to make the world a better place. That's really what it's all about. So thanks, Robert. Well, um, I can assure you, uh, you've succeeded in all those things, General. Uh, you've been a, a wonderful partner, mentor, boss, uh, leader. Um, and uh, please take um, my thanks, uh, but, uh, but also know that there's a grateful nation for the decisions that you made. And I guess please thank Laura as well along the way, because uh, I certainly do know how, how big a burden uh, the spouses and family members take too. So, um, as I said at the start, sir, I know you're going to run through the tape, so this is not, uh, there's no coasting allowed, but, um, uh, but uh, I just want to thank you for that service and, uh, and, uh, and just also be confident that it's going to be passed on. Those that you've mentored, those that you've taught will, will continue the race, and, and I have a funny feeling you'll continue to be in the race in some way, shape, or form, so uh, um, uh, look forward to that as well. So from all of us at Planet uh, and from uh, the conference here, thanks for sharing your time, uh, but more importantly, thanks for sharing your insights uh, and your vision and your aspiration and your encouragement. Uh, we all get, uh, get in this together, uh, increase our partnerships, uh, stay focused on the outcomes, um, and as you rightly said, make the world a better place. Thanks very much, General. Thanks, Robert. Good luck with the conference. Good luck to you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.